Welcome to the Feeling Better Podcast. My name is Maria, and I'm the host of this podcast and the author of the book, The Feeling Better 10-4 Program, that teaches you a practical, effective, inspirational 10-week program to help you overcome your compulsive gambling addiction. Thank you for being here. Happy Father's Day to all of you who are fathers. I hope you enjoy your special day and that it's filled with love and joy. And today, my friends, is my 20th episode. That's so crazy because it feels like I've been at this a lot longer than that. I truly appreciate each and every one of my listeners. I want to give a big shout out to those who have kindly rated or reviewed my podcast positively with five-star ratings on your podcast platform of choice. I so appreciate you. The more reviews and ratings, the higher up in the rankings I go, which means the more will stumble upon my podcast when they're searching for help with compulsive gambling addiction or any other kind of addiction or spiritual warfare. Before I dive in, I just want to say a big thank you to Christina from the Broke Girl Society. I had the honor and privilege of coming onto her podcast and doing an interview for her show. She is absolutely lovely and doing some terrific things for women in the problem gambling community. I honestly could have talked to her for days. She'll be uploading that episode soon, and so I'll let you know when it goes live. In our discussion, I mentioned to her that lately, now that I'm done reading the Feeling Better book on my podcast and am just addressing different topics each week, I get more downloads and listens when I address Christian spiritual topics, which is kind of interesting. I think there are a lot more people out there than I realize who are really needing that deep spiritual overhaul who truly identified with addressing their gambling addiction as a spiritual attack. For some, like me, it was a blindsided attack out of nowhere. Others, though, experienced that subtle, long-term, slow-burn kind of attack over many years. It's kind of like getting a virus on your computer. Sometimes it just totally shuts it down and incapacitates it. Other times, it slows and bogs down the system over time with incremental degradation that causes you annoyance and frustration, but that you don't really realize is slowly eating away at your hard drive until it's too late. Which is a great segue into today's topic. Today's episode is going to be a unique, special edition. The subject matter comes from a listener's question, a male this time, who emailed me a few weeks ago. He found my podcast while in some tough moments trying to overcome his own gambling addiction, which, in his case, was sports betting. He's a Muslim and he was curious as to how and why I converted to Christianity. More specifically, what it was that caused me to put my faith in Christ, rather than Allah, which is what the Muslims call the Islamic God. So what I'll be sharing doesn't have a direct correlation to gambling addiction, but as I said last week, most of us fall into a gambling addiction or some other kind of addiction because of imbalance. A lot of times, That's an imbalance in our spiritual lives, and so this does address that indirectly. So my apologies, my dear listener friend, for taking so long to get to this. I needed a few weeks to properly think out and research what I wanted to say in response. Before I dive in, I want to say that in no way do I have any intention of tearing down the Muslim people. We are all God's children made in His image. We're instructed, as Christ believers, to build people up, to edify all the people, which means to instruct, to guide, to improve, to uplift, and to enlighten. You cannot edify a person or a group of people, build them up, by tearing them down. That's a principle that I wish more of our society would adopt these days. Christ came to save and heal the sick, not the healthy. Those who are suffering, lost, searching, confused, downcast, lonely, depressed, scared, addicted, full of anxiety, hopelessness, restlessness, 
or just sad. All of them are sick. All of those things are symptoms of a sick and broken spirit. Nearly the entire time that I lived as a Muslim child and teenager, I had a troubled and conflicted and broken spirit. So I understand what it means to feel that. It's a different kind of troubled and conflicted and broken spirit that I felt this year while under spiritual attack. In this season of my life as a Christian, there was always the hope of God's promises the faithful guidance of the Holy Spirit, the forgiveness of sins through the blood of Christ, and God's word to lift me up and give me renewed strength every day. The brokenness and conflict I felt came from my own flesh, my own sin, that was the result of giving in to temptation. It's very different from the troubled, lost feeling that one has day in and day out, not having any knowledge of the one true God. So that is my purpose in today's episode, to help anyone, Muslim or otherwise, understand what makes a false religion and why there is only one true God. So this listener specifically asked me in his email, what made you convert to Christianity and why did you not find Islam to be your one true religion? So again, while this topic doesn't specifically address gambling addiction, My podcast is, after all, about spiritual attack, and I believe that spiritual attack comes in many, many forms. One of Satan's most prevalent, most permeating, and most successful is the spiritual attack of false religions. Now, I don't have the time or the knowledge to provide a detailed comparison or a really deep dive into Islam versus Christianity. But what I can share is my experience and my own personal thoughts and research on the topic. As gambling becomes more normalized and as Islam continues to grow around the world, I'm sure there will be other Muslims who stumble upon this podcast seeking help in overcoming their addictions, especially in places like the UK or even here in Michigan where there's a large concentration of Muslims in the metro Detroit area. The butterfly effect of God's work in our lives is miraculous. If you're a Muslim who found yourself deep in the hellish prison of gambling addiction, then the devil is attacking you, wanting to bring you down, destroy you, confuse you, or distract you. That means he either sees you as a threat or knows that God is working in your life to bring you into a new season, a new understanding. And that worries Satan. So he's attempting to pull you away from whatever good things that God has put in your future path. And if you're a Muslim who's listening to this, or you know a Muslim who is struggling, then this message is for you or to share with that person. As I mentioned, I was raised as a Muslim. My father was born a Sunni Muslim in Lebanon and came here to the United States in his teens. He met my mother shortly after he came here, and I have no doubt that he married her for the opportunity to gain his citizenship. You see, my mother was a vanilla, suburban, fairly average-looking Midwestern Catholic American. She had been in a bad situation at the time she met my father, having gotten pregnant just out of high school. My grandparents were very immersed in their Catholic parish and church, So that was a huge disgrace and scandal at the time. I don't know this from evidence or with certainty, but in my opinion, knowing my father, I don't believe there was any way that he, a traditional Arab Muslim and firstborn male of the family, would have chosen this nondescript, unwed, pregnant Catholic woman to be his wife unless there was something that he could gain from it. He told me once that he'd come here on a school visa but he stopped going to school when he discovered all of the opportunities for business and money-making here in the United States, and thus he was at risk of being deported. He was with my mother when she gave birth to that baby and then gave it up for adoption. I'm sure she had felt lonely, ostracized, defensive, and maybe even a bit scared for her future when she met my father. 
I could easily see her falling for his handsome, exotic looks and accent. She was always a dreamer, my mother, and it's not hard to imagine my father seeing the opportune situation. And, like all things in this world, God has a plan and a path for everyone. It was his will that they be married. I mean, without them, I wouldn't be here today. I don't doubt that my father loved my mother in his own way, or at least grew to love her over time. My mother readily agreed to convert to Islam, raising us kids under the Islamic religion. To my father's credit, he was a hard worker, always getting up every morning to go to work and provide for his family. Unlike the story of my husband that I shared last week, I never had an empty stomach or wanted for any material thing. I always had clothes to wear, toys to play with, food to eat. Growing up as a young kid, I honestly had a fairly normal childhood, all things considered. We lived in the burbs of Metro Detroit where I went to school, played with the neighbor kids, spent my Saturday mornings eating Applejack cereal and watching 80s cartoons, and I read books by Laura Ingalls Wilder and Judy Bloom. I did, however, have to begin attending a Quran school when I was about the age of seven or eight. This was when my parents began first attempting to immerse us into the world of Islam. To say I struggled with it is an understatement. First of all, my sister and I had to fast for Ramadan. If you're not familiar with that, the rules dictate that you cannot eat anything from sunup to sundown for one entire month. Not a drop of water not a single crumb of food, no gum, nothing to quench your thirst or satisfy your hunger. After sundown, you could eat and drink all you want. Every year this came and went, shifting on the calendar based on the cycle of the moon. Back then, when I first started fasting in the early 80s, Ramadan fell during the long, hot months of summer vacation in June and July. And, of course, it was forbidden to eat or drink anything while the sun was up, and it wasn't based on the sunset at the location of Mecca, the holy city of Islam. Oh no, it was based on where you live. That meant, as an eight-year-old girl, I couldn't eat or drink a single thing from like 5.30 in the morning until 9.30 at night. I was intelligent enough to understand longitudes and latitudes, feeling envious of our relatives in Florida who got to sleep in an hour later and eat an hour earlier because they were closer to the equator. Do you know how hard it was for a kid to have to wake up at five in the morning on summer vacation just so you could eat and drink? And if you were too sleepy and chose to stay in bed, you lost your opportunity to even take a sip of water until the sun went down again that evening. Playing outside in the summer heat was grueling and torturous while fasting that strictly. Not once did anyone ever explain why it was necessary to do that or what the purpose of it was. All I knew was that the fear of Allah and his obscure, cruel punishment awaited me if I even dipped my finger into a drop of water to refresh my tongue. For anyone out there who knows their Bible— That sounds a lot like the agonizing hell the rich man found himself in, in the story Jesus told about Lazarus and the rich man, doesn't it? So, as I mentioned, in addition to that, my sister and I went to an Islamic religious school on weekends, every weekend, all year long, outside of our regular school. We attended this with other kids in Metro Detroit, in particular Dearborn, which even to this day has the highest concentration of Muslims in the U.S. per capita. Most of the other kids spoke Arabic, but we didn't. Even though our father and extended relatives spoke it, we only learned a smattering of words and phrases. There was one teacher in the school who told us a few stories from the Quran in English, like the story of Adam or Abraham, always focusing more on Ishmael, rather than Isaac. Ishmael was the illegitimate firstborn son of Abraham, born of his wife's housemaid, who was supposedly the founder of the Arab people 
an ancestor of Muhammad. More on that later. But mostly our lessons were given in Arabic, which we didn't understand. We were expected to memorize the Arabic verses from the Quran, which we did dutifully. My sister and I could recite verses perfectly with our little girl American accents, but had no idea whatsoever what we were saying or what any of it meant. Often on Sundays, our parents would sit us down in front of the television, and we'd have to watch the local Arabic TV station, which featured a two-hour-long Islamic sermon with an imam speaking Arabic and reciting verses from the Quran. My father understood what he was saying, but my mother and us girls had no clue. It was ridiculously boring and long and felt like an endless, torturous way to spend a Sunday evening. I'm not sure if our parents thought we'd somehow absorb what was being said, even though it was in Arabic. I'm honestly not sure. But I was grateful when that programming ended a few years later. To me, Islamic school was torturous. We had to wear a head covering, and that part didn't bother me so much. It was the prayer time that I dreaded. The girls were separated from the boys, and we had to wash ritually before prayer. I don't remember the order now, but it was something like the head and the face first, then the arms and the hands, which had to be done three times, then each foot three times. And you had to wash from right to left, chanting or whispering the pre-prayer before you went into the prayer room for the formal prayer. Then, once you were washed, you went into that prayer room where we each had a little mat for our prayer. That was the part that I hated the most. You had to face east, or I guess southeast, toward Mecca, the holy city, to pray properly. And then at that point, there were 12 steps to the prayer process. As Americans, you've probably seen examples of Islamic prayer with men down on their knees, prostrate with their heads on the ground on the mats. What you don't see are all the different steps involved. I had to look this up because I didn't remember it. But first, you have to make your intention to pray, and then you raise your hands to your ears and say, Allahu Akbar, which means God is great. Then you place your hands on your chest, and then you look down at the ground, and then you recite the opening chapter of the Quran. Then you bow down, then you stand up again, and then you get down on your knees with your head to the floor, and you recite more. And then you sit back on your haunches and recite more. And then you go back down and you get the idea. As little kids, we had no clue whatsoever what we were doing. We just followed along with everyone else, mimicking their movements and reciting what we so obediently memorized but did not at all understand. Back then, my grandmother, and nowadays my father, Pray this way five times a day, at specific times of the day, as instructed and decreed in the Islamic faith. As a precocious child, I used to ask all kinds of questions. What happens if you're crippled and can't pray like that? What happens if you do the ritual washing in the wrong order? What happens if you drink something when you're supposed to be fasting? I don't recall exactly what my father's answers were to those questions, but it was something along the lines of, Allah will punish you harshly. I really struggled with that answer. All of the rules were so hard, so complicated, so confusing and uncomfortable. The God I was learning about felt to me like a very mean, very stern, very unyielding and formidable God like a solemn, stern grandfather that a child would want to avoid as much as possible. I distinctly remember once asking him after months of Islamic school and finally getting the hang of praying, how do you actually get to heaven? Paradise is what they call it. They never taught us that. My father replied, by faith and living religiously and good deeds and actions, and ask a love for forgiveness when you do wrong. I recall feeling crestfallen with utter disappointment. 
if living religiously meant praying and fasting like that for the rest of my life, I was not going to make it to paradise. I knew then that the moment I was old enough to be on my own, I would leave the Islamic religion behind for good. My father was a harsh, violent man who used his hand or his belt to beat us girls whenever we were disobedient. He had moments here and there, especially when we were younger, when he did fun things with us or joked around with us. My father has a great sense of humor and can be a very jocular, charming man. But it was clear that he enjoyed babies and little kids versus teenagers. While my childhood wasn't all that terrible, my teenage years were awful. Once I hit about 12 or 13 years old, when the hormones kicked in and I became self-conscious, aware of my looks, my clothes, or of boys, and felt the desire to bond with my friends and have a social life with them, my father just did not know how to handle it. Where he came from, teenage girls dressed modestly, they learned how to cook and clean and care for their home by working alongside their mothers. They did this until they got married, and then they would continue doing that for their own husband and children. But there I was, using Aquanet hairspray and wearing neon bangle bracelets and listening to Madonna on the radio and squealing whenever it was time to watch Growing Pains because Kirk Cameron was so cute. In my father's world back home in Beirut, girls didn't hang out at malls with their friends or play in the marching band or talk on the phone for an hour or try out for cheerleading or want to go to the movies and listen to rap music or put posters of boy actors on their walls. I attempted to do all those things that my other suburban girlfriends were doing, but my father would absolutely not allow it. I think, honestly, a lot of his strictness when raising me had to do with the fact that when he met my mother, she was a pregnant teenager, and so he probably had a preconceived notion that American girls were promiscuous and destined for a life of shame and regret, unworthy of being a virtuous candidate for a real marriage. As a result, he ruled our home with an endless set of strict rules, most of which made no sense to this teenage girl. If a friend called, he would stand over me, glaring down at me, and if I talked for more than five minutes, he'd bark, "'What do they want? You don't need to sit on the phone talking about nothing.' You have cleaning to do. Hang up. There was one time I remember distinctly when I was about 14 years old. In the room I shared with my sister, I had my half of the bedroom walls plastered with all kinds of posters of Kirk Cameron, Corey Haim and Corey Feldman, Brian Bloom, Alyssa Milano, New Kids on the Block, and the cast of Goonies, taken from teen magazines that I'd bought with my babysitting money. I had my dresser covered neatly with different perfumes, secret makeup containers that I wasn't allowed to wear to school yet, and my pink boombox radio with all of my favorite cassette tapes. The day before, I had snuck off to the mall with a friend when I was really supposed to be at her house studying. It was totally innocent. Her mom drove us, and for one hour, we walked around, ate pizza in the food court, window shopped, and browsed through the tapes at the music store. I had bought a pair of really rad jean shorts with my spending money and tucked them away in a bottom drawer, knowing my father wouldn't approve of the shorts or the trip to the mall. But somehow he found out. And the next day, when I came home from school, I walked into the bedroom to find it ransacked from top to bottom. All of my posters had been ripped off the walls, shred into pieces. The threads of tape had been yanked out of my cassettes in tangled piles, ruining them. Every item of clothing had been pulled out of my drawers or from the closet and strewn to the floor, and no sign of my new jean shorts, of course. And all of my perfumes and lotions and knick-knack figurines had been thrown to the ground, most broken or smashed. Not a single thing of my sister's had been touched, just mine. 
It was as if the Incredible Hulk had come through in a rage, ripping apart or breaking or throwing every single thing that I had owned. Numb with grief and confusion, I sat there on the floor in the middle of the mess that I knew would take days to clean up and put back in order, sobbing loudly in despair and confusion. My mother, not wanting to hear any of my wailing, shut my bedroom door and locked it from the outside. I cried and cried and cried, hating Allah, not believing for a second that he was real. Otherwise, I'd feel some kind of comfort, some kind of solace or direction or understanding in God. But in my anguish, I did have the tiny thought, I wonder if Jesus would help me instead. I didn't know anything about Jesus, other than the fact that my maternal grandmother, my mother's mother, was a devout Catholic who loved Jesus. She was the sweetest, kindest grandmother, but she feared the wrath of my father and knew better than to talk about Jesus with me, and we didn't get to see her as often as I would have liked. My father tended to avoid her like the plague, but I adored her and she had often let me know that she had prayed for me throughout my entire life. Today, I look back on that memory, and I somehow know, I just know, that the Lord heard my cry. He saw me in that moment, and I know now that he had looked down on me back then, knowing full well that one day he would comfort me and offer me solace and understanding. Jesus said in the Beatitudes, which was a collection of blessings he gave in the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I didn't know it then, but that was my very first prayer to the one true God. No ritual washing, no prayer mat, No copycat movements and righteous precision in the reciting of the foreign words that I didn't understand. Just one broken and confused teenage girl, sobbing in fear and rejection of her earthly father, but held within the heart and within the love of her heavenly father. I have long since forgiven my father for all of that. He was a flawed human who fails at parenting having no understanding of how to raise teenage girls in America. His father was a strict, stern man who ruled with an iron fist, and so that was all he knew. I believe in his heart that he wanted to protect and raise me to be a virtuous, productive, worthy young woman. And of course, I know now that he couldn't have succeeded in being a loving, compassionate, understanding father when he was misguided in believing a false religion. I hold no grudge against him, and over the last few years have enjoyed my long-distance relationship with him. He lives in Lebanon again now, and I've tried to share my faith with him to show him what he never knew about salvation in Christ. He rejects it, but he does not reject me, which means I still hold out the hope that one day, I'll be a witness to him and that he will come to know Jesus the way I do. I'll never forget when I was in my 30s as I was newly learning about the Christian faith. One of the things that totally blew me away was finding out that there was no ritual for prayer, 
no specific order of verses to memorize in prayer, and that you could pray to God whether you were facing north, south, east, or west. You could pray in bed, on your knees, sitting down, standing up, in a wheelchair, or lying in a hospital ward hooked up to a dozen machines. God lived inside of us as the Holy Spirit, and so Christians had a constant, immediate connection to God, and we were encouraged to pray to Him as our one true Father who instructs us to abide in Him, to live in Him, to seek Him, and to lean on Him. Bible Scripture clearly encouraged believers to pray in a deep relationship with God, thanking Him and presenting our requests to Him, conversing with the Lord in a very personal way. That absolutely stunned me. I remember the first time I prayed my first prayer of forgiveness, salvation, and devotion to Christ. I was actually driving in my car one beautiful late afternoon in the fall, just driving around looking at all the fall colors, listening to Christian music on the radio. I recall laughing through my tears that the most important, most passionate, most memorable prayer of my life was not in a mosque with all the proper washing and head covering facing southeast in the women's quarters, nor was it in a church or a reverend cathedral sitting in a pew with incense and candles. Nope, I had been in my car, hands on the steering wheel, driving, and yet God heard me, and that prayer forever changed my life. Amazing. Allow me, if I may, to share some fundamental perceptions about Islam versus Christianity from my own perspectives and research. This, again, is not intended to shame or rebuke any Muslim believer. There is no personal attack or condemnation on any person or group of people. Rather, I'm going to present reasons why I have no doubt that Islam is a false religion. This is an imperative piece of the story because I am sure there are masses of Muslim believers out there who were like me when I was young. I'd never learned about Jesus. I never knew anything other than what I was born into and brought up with. I'm eternally grateful for those co-workers in my 30s who shared with me a different perspective so that I could expand my knowledge and learn about something that had been kept hidden from me the first three decades of my life. If you're interested in any other perspective besides mine, there is a really, really terrific book out there by James R. White titled, What Every Christian Needs to Know About the Quran. I wish I could give that book away to any Muslim who is searching, seeking, or feeling like there should be more. I have the audiobook version, and it's very wonderfully written in a very easy-to-understand way. There are also two books by the late, great Dr. Nabil Qureshi that I highly recommend that dive much deeper and are much more intellectual in the comparisons between the two religions. One is called Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus, and the other one is No One But God, Allah or Jesus. I listened to them both years ago, and they're fantastic as well. All three of those are available on Amazon as print books or on Audible as audiobooks, and I'll put links into the show notes of this episode for anyone who wants to read them or listen to them. So, after that incident with my father tearing apart my bedroom, I wanted no part of the Islamic religion. We eventually stopped going to the Islamic school. My mother was tired of fighting my sister and me on it because we would cry and complain and resist every single time that we had to go. Plus, it was pretty far to drive every weekend. In all that time, I never, not once, ever learned about the character of the Islamic God, what Allah's love or compassion might be for all his people. All I ever heard about was how unbelievers should be executed or endure humiliating punishment. The God I grew up with 
was one of many, many rules and many punishments, and all which were blurred and integrated with the rules of the Arab culture and society. There were far more rules and many, many more punishments for women than there were for men, as my boy cousins had way more freedom than I could have ever hoped for. I gave up trying to make the connection between some of those rules of culture and religion. I wasn't allowed to eat pork. It was unclean and against our religion. I wasn't allowed to participate in sports or join the cheerleading squad. It was against our religion for girls to intermingle with boys. I wasn't allowed to date. That was absolutely against our religion. No dances, no prom, no sleepovers at friends' houses, no camp, no overnight school trips, no going away to college even. Everything that I tried or wanted to do as a typical American teenage girl was met with the same answer from my parents every time. It is against our religion. Admittedly, I was a bit sassy to my parents at the time, asking repeatedly, so please tell me where in the Quran it says I can't go to the homecoming dance? Or which surah says I can't go to the high school basketball game this Friday evening? More often than not, it earned me a good beating or a week's worth of grounding to my room. My parents often used the threat of sending me off to Saudi Arabia as punishment whenever I got caught sneaking off with friends without permission or getting a phone call from a boy. They made it clear that living in Saudi Arabia, I would have zero freedoms as a woman and that I would have to wear a burqa and spend my days cooking, cleaning, and caring for my husband and children, and it would be exactly the discipline that I needed, since in their eyes, I was a rebellious, disrespectful, and unfaithful teenager. Back then in the 90s, women had very few rights in Saudi Arabia. I think they've made a few strides in equality these last several years, but at that time, Saudi Arabia treated women like minors. Women were essentially properties of their husbands or fathers or brothers. They were segregated from the men, and they were not allowed to drive or travel anywhere without their male relative's permission. And they were generally not allowed to work outside the home, and they had no rights or say with regard to child care, marriage, or legal matters. And they had no political voice and were not allowed to vote. And a lot of times, unfortunately, they were victims of domestic abuse with no legal recourse. As a 15 or 16-year-old girl, I would challenge my parents when they threatened me with this, asking, tell me again how this is a merciful religion of love and peace? In my senior year of high school, I had to write a term paper for my English class, and knowing I was a Muslim, my teacher suggested I use that topic for my paper. It was only then, doing research at my local library, that I learned the Prophet Muhammad, who was the foundation for the entire Islamic religion, wasn't even born until nearly 600 years after Christ. That shocked me. I had learned no concept of the timing of Muhammad growing up and had been led to believe that Muhammad was seriously ancient like way back, in the days of the prophets and well before Christ. I knew Islam recognized Jesus as a real person, but only as a simple prophet, not as the resurrected Son of God, the Messiah for all people. I also learned that Muhammad had 12 wives. 12. And, on top of that, his third wife that he married when he was 50 years old was only six or seven years old. But Mohammed graciously waited until she was nine to have sex with her. Yeah, the Islamic school never taught us that one. Some Muslims today try to justify that by saying back then, people lived shorter lives and young marriages were common and the norm. Sure, I can understand that, Perhaps a 14-year-old girl being betrothed to a 16-year-old boy or something. But there is nothing and no one 
that can convince me that there was anything right or ethical about a 53-year-old man marrying and betting a nine-year-old. I'll never forget that moment, sitting back in my chair at the local city library, stunned at what I'd read in the reference book on the table in front of me. This supposed holy prophet and the founder of the great religion of the one true merciful God was actually a polygamist and a pedophile? I shuddered at the thought of being a nine-year-old girl having to have sex with a 53-year-old man, someone old enough to be my grandfather. How in the world was that holy? Disgusted, I shut the books, closed my notepad, and walked out of the library. That next day, I told my teacher that I wanted to switch my topic and write about Scottish castles instead. I still have a lot of relatives that are Muslim. Some of my relatives are only cafeteria Muslims, meaning the only doctrine of Islam they stick to is not eating pork. They don't study the Quran or go to the mosque or fellowship with other Muslims to discuss religion or theology or even pray. Others, though, like my father, are quite devout, attending mosque and praying diligently five times a day. So, in my time as a saved Christian, I've read books like those by Nabil Qureshi, who've converted from Islam to Christianity. And I've also read a good portion of the Quran myself. I have a deep heart and love for the Muslim people, as they are, for the most part, kind, capable, intelligent, well-intentioned human beings who've been deceived by the devil in the same way that I had been deceived by the devil in my gambling addiction. I said earlier that Satan uses many, many tactics in his spiritual battle against God's people. The deception of a false religion is one of the successful, if not the most successful, battle plans that Satan has ever carried out. I don't judge those who believe in their Islamic faith whatsoever. I pray for each and every one of them. If even 10% of Muslims could come to see the light of the truth that I'm sharing today that I understood, it would be a revival of the Christian faith on a level we've never seen. It would truly be a miracle that I hope to live to see one day. I think very few people out there have actually read both the Bible and the Quran, but there are some stark differences that shine a spotlight on Satan's sloppy, confusing, but successful attempt at creating a false religion that mimics Christianity. Maybe it's because I have the Holy Spirit inside me that illuminates this in a way that others might not be able to see. It's clear to me, though, that the Bible is leagues above the Quran in many ways. The Quran is a poor forgery, like suddenly someone uncovered a new, never-before-seen version of the Mona Lisa, crudely created in shades of black and white charcoal, claiming to be painted by Leonardo da Vinci's great-grandson, the original creator and the true talent behind the famous portrait. Now, nothing about that statement makes any sense, does it? The Islamic texts of the Quran are just as confounding in that idea. Allow me to state a few of my own personal points comparing the Christian Bible versus the Islamic Quran. For starters, when you read the opening of the Bible, it describes in great detail a very clear timeline of God's creation. The opening verses of the Bible speak to God's almighty power and sovereignty as creator of all things. You understand that the passages in the beginning of Genesis are rich in imagery and explain quite distinctly God's original order of design, and then go on to explain mankind's fall into sin through Eve's temptation by Satan. Thus begins the very intricate story of humanity, from the beginning of creation and Adam to the very end of the ages and Christ's return for his people. But when you read the opening verses of the Quran, they sound like the journal of someone who's a bit schizophrenic, or perhaps even a cheeky teenager who's getting up in front of his class to give a speech, showing off in front of everyone with flowery, meaningless, rambling prose 
that might evoke a bit of feeling, but has no real message behind it. I want to show you the comparison. In the first and longest book of the Quran, which are called surahs, it begins with these first verses. This is the book. There is no doubt about it. A guide for those mindful of Allah who believe in the unseen, establish prayer, and donate from what we have provided for them, and who believe in what has been revealed to you, O Prophet, and what was revealed before you, and have sure faith in the hereafter. It is they who are truly guided by their Lord, and it is they who will be successful. As for those who persist in disbelief, it is the same whether you warn them or not. They will never believe. Allah has sealed their hearts and their hearing, and their sight is covered. They will suffer a tremendous punishment. And there are some who say we believe in Allah in the last day, yet they are not true believers. They seek to deceive Allah and the believers, and yet they only deceive themselves, but they fail to perceive it. There is sickness in their hearts, and Allah only lets their sickness increase. They will suffer a painful punishment for their lies. Those were the first ten verses of the Quran. Did any of that make any sense? or provide any kind of grand opening scripture to begin a powerful message of God to his people? I mean, no disrespect, truly. But how is that the beginning of the true, authoritative book that's supposed to be the foundation for the supposed one true religion of all mankind? Let's compare that to the first ten verses of the Bible from the New Living Translation. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that the light was good. Then he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness night, and evening passed and morning came, marking the first day. Then God said, Let there be a space between the waters to separate the waters of the heavens from the waters of the earth. And that is what happened. God made this space to separate the waters of the earth from the waters of the heavens. And God called this space sky. And evening passed and morning came, marking the second day. Then God said, Let the waters beneath the sky flow together into one place, so dry ground may appear. And that is what happened. God called the dry ground land, and the waters seas, and God saw that it was good. And from there, it goes on to describe the rest of God's creation step by step, including the creation of man. You see the difference? One is telling the story of creation that God had made, which he declared good. And the other is rambling on about tremendous painful suffering and punishment for those who don't believe what's in the book. I don't know what you think from that, but I recall from taking some psychology courses back in my community college days that taught me when someone begins to speak with negativity and defensiveness and accusations, That person is either dealing with some deep conflicting personal issues or trying to hide something. Either way, that doesn't feel very awe-inspiring to me. Out of curiosity, as I was putting my notes together for this episode, I googled various versions of the question, why is the Quran so disjointed? Or why is the Quran so confusing? Or why is the Quran so hard to read? And I got several results explaining that, one, the arrangement of the chapters or the surahs are not in chronological order or even arranged by theme. And two, the only real way to understand the true meaning of the Quran is to know Arabic, because so much gets lost in translation to English, and it doesn't come across our language or any other language accurately. It's meant to be read in Arabic. This, too, had me scratching my head. If this is supposedly God's true word, his revelation and edict for all mankind, for the whole world to live by, wouldn't it be in some kind of order and make sense for all people, 
all nations and languages, even those that are non-Arabic? Wikipedia even says in its entry for the explanation of surahs that, to this day, the exact order of the Quran has completely eluded scholars. Wikipedia and other sources also say that the Quran wasn't even written down or available in any kind of written form whatsoever at the time of Muhammad's death. According to Islamic history, Muhammad was a man who received a special message from the angel Gabriel while he was on one of his retreats in a cave in the mountains. Did you know that Muhammad resisted three times taking that message and writing it down as the angel instructed him to do? In fact, most scholars agree with the biographical account that Muhammad was so confused and so conflicted and so frightened by the angel that he ran away thinking he was being haunted by a jinn, which is the Arabic word for evil spirit. He was so tormented by it, in fact, that the texts say he ran to go throw himself off a cliff in an act of suicide. But the angel Gabriel stopped him before he went through with it. Now, does that sound like a holy situation or godly encounter as a messenger for all of mankind to you? I'm sorry, but I don't take suicidal thoughts lightly these days. I would have had an extremely hard time believing that the God of all the universe, who mercifully loves all of humanity, would drive his one true messenger and prophet to jump to his death. I'm just speaking from personal experience here, but the only time that I was so scared, so fearful and frightened that I had thoughts about wanting to die was when I was face-to-face with demons. Just saying. Conversely, Jesus knew that he was the Messiah, the Son of God, from a young age. The Bible said that when he was 12 years old, Jesus' family went to the temple for the festival of Passover. When the festival was over, Jesus' parents began making their way back home with all the crowds, thinking that Jesus was with them. But when they realized he wasn't, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. Three days later, they found him sitting in the temple courts with the rabbis, listening and asking questions. In the Gospel of Luke at the end of chapter 2, Scripture says, Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So, you've got two stories of the early days of the foundational characters of two different religions. One was a grown adult man who was approached by a fearsome angel, and who was so reluctant, scared, and confused that he attempted to commit suicide. The other was a 12-year-old boy who amazed everyone at the temple, which he referred to as his father's house with wisdom and understanding of the religious teachings, and then continued to grow into a man in wisdom and stature and favor with God and men. Which biography makes you feel more comfortable and confident and trusting of the truth of God? Let me remind you that Satan is an angel too. Paul tells us that Satan masquerades as an angel of light, 2 Corinthians 11.14 In addition, the very beginning of the Gospels, in Matthew verse 1, there is a clear and distinct genealogy that tells us every single ancestor of Jesus, all the way back to King David, and then even further back to Abraham. On the other hand, I could not find a specific genealogy for Muhammad, no matter how I scoured the internet. I found dozens of references that state Muslims believe that Muhammad is a descendant of Ishmael, 
Abraham's first son that he had illegitimately with his wife's maid, Hagar. But I couldn't find a single definitive genealogy of those ancestors in that line. I had even asked my father once why the Muslims think Ishmael is the line that the rightful believers come from, and he had answered me, because he was the firstborn. Firstborn males always inherit their father's kingdom. On the surface, that might make sense, but there are two things wrong with that. One, Ishmael, the firstborn, was born in sin, in adultery outside of the marriage between Sarah and Abraham. He might have been older than Isaac, but he wasn't the legitimate son in the union between husband and wife. And two, I've always heard that Muslims acknowledge and believe the Torah, and it clearly states in the book of Genesis that God instructed Abraham to take his one and only son, Isaac, to Mount Moriah to be sacrificed. It clearly states in Genesis 17, 15 through 21, God also said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. Abraham fell face down. He laughed and said to himself, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And Abraham said to God, If only Ishmael might live under your blessing. Then God said, Yes, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you, I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful, and I will greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of twelve rulers, and I will make him into a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you by this time next year. What exactly was that covenant? It says very plainly in that same chapter of Genesis, Abram fell face down and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations out of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. Genesis seventeen three through 8 So God promised 12 rulers that were to come from Ishmael. We know the 12 tribes of Israel came from Isaac's line through Jacob. But what happened to Ishmael's line? Who were they? The Bible tells us that as well, in great detail, in fact. Farther into Genesis, in chapter 25, verses 12 through 18, it says, This is the account of the family line of Abraham's son Ishmael, whom Sarah's slave Hagar, the Egyptian, bore to Abraham. These are the names of the sons of Ishmael, listed in the order of their birth. Nebaioth, the firstborn of Ishmael, Kedar, Adbil, Mibsem, Mishma, Duma, Masa, Hadad, Tima, Jetur, Napish, and Kedema, if I'm saying those right. These were the sons of Ishmael, and these are the names of the twelve tribal rulers according to their settlements and camps. Ishmael lived 137 years. He breathed his last and died, and he was gathered to his people. His descendants settled in the area from Havila as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt as you go towards Assyria, and they lived in hostility toward all the tribes related to them. 
So Isaac and his people were given the land of Canaan by God. What was the land of Canaan? That's easy to find. There are gazillion sources out there that show the land of Canaan encompassed all of Israel, including Palestine and the West Bank, all of Lebanon, all of Jordan, and part of southern Syria. What is Havilah as far as Shur? Well, we know from Exodus that Moses and his people entered into the wilderness of Shur after crossing the Red Sea. So nearly every ancient biblical or Jewish scholar agrees that it's the peninsula of Saudi Arabia. And it took only a few quick searches to confirm that Havilah is also in Saudi Arabia. So if God gave Abraham and the Jewish people the land of Canaan, which is Lebanon, Israel, Jordan, and southern Syria, and if Ishmael's people settled in Saudi Arabia and multiplied into various kingdoms and tribes there, then why do the Muslim people claim Jerusalem is theirs? Why is there a mosque sitting on Mount Moriah where Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac and where King Solomon built the first temple to honor God? I honestly don't know. Some articles on the internet say that the Muslim people believe that God instructed Abraham to sacrifice Ishmael, not Isaac. But that makes no sense. For one, the Muslims supposedly concur and uphold the teachings of Genesis, which are pretty clear. Secondly, we all know that the entire story of Abraham sacrificing his only true legitimate son is a foreshadowing, a symbol, and a prophecy for God sacrificing his own one true legitimate son, Jesus, 2,000 years later. I saw some references that Muslims don't believe that's true, but the parallels can't be ignored. Isaac was born as a miracle of God to a barren woman. Jesus was born as a miracle of God to a virgin woman. God refers to Isaac as Abraham's only son. Jesus is often referred to or refers to himself as God's only son. Isaac and Abraham were accompanied by two servants. Jesus was accompanied to his death by two criminals. Abraham specifically made Isaac carry the wood for his sacrifice. Jesus had to carry his own cross for his sacrifice. Isaac was to be sacrificed as an innocent offering on Mount Moriah. Jesus was sacrificed as an innocent offering on the hill across from Mount Moriah, where the holy temple of God sat. Isaac was saved by God in his grace. Jesus was resurrected to save us in God's grace. Moving on. Mohammed, while on his retreats in the cave, continued to receive these special messages from Gabriel over the course of 23 years. Most all Islamic scholars agree that Muhammad himself didn't even write anything down, that it was all passed down verbally until about 20 or 30 years after his death when his followers finally began writing things down on or around the year 650. With that then, how can one compare that to the Bible? There are over 1,200 prophecies that foretold the future in advance throughout the Old Testament centuries long before Jesus was even born. And of those, there are 353 prophecies that specifically pertain to the Messiah, which were all fulfilled by Jesus. It's true. You can go ahead and look that up. And in the New Testament portion, after Jesus was born, there are 578 prophecies that speak to the end times or his second coming. The Bible was written in explicit chronological order, from the very beginning of the creation of the world to the very end of it when Christ will come back to rule again. We're talking about humanity here. How could the Word of God not be in chronological order, or not have some kind of timeline or even organization to its teachings? I mean, I can't even put together a piece of furniture or cook a recipe without specific chronological steps. And, not to mention, without chronological order, you can't have clear, explicit cross-references. 
One of the coolest graphics out there on the internet is a depiction of every cross-reference in the Bible. I'm going to put a link to it from the Guardian's News website in my show notes, but you can also find it by googling up the keywords, The Guardian Holy Infographics. It's the neatest thing ever. Did you know that there are 63,779 cross-references back and forth between the verses in the Bible? The Bible was written by approximately 40 different authors inspired by God, spanning 66 different books or sections within, encompassing nearly 1,200 chapters. Think about the magnitude of divine authorship and the intricate supernatural inspiration it would require to create that many references within all of those writings. Nearly 64,000! That's absolutely mind-blowing to me. In the Holy Infographic link that shows all of those cross-references, each one is represented by an arc, with the bar at the bottom depicting the different books of the Bible. The color of the arc corresponds to the distance between the two cross-referenced chapters. You have to see this. It's extraordinary. The effect is a stunning, intricate rainbow, which is the symbol of God's covenant with us, as it's stated in Genesis 9. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and and all the living creatures of every kind on this earth. So God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all life on earth. Back to the Quran. When I do searches on the prophecies within the Quran, most of them revolve around the end times and mimic almost word for word what the Bible says. Like, for example, There's a prophecy about Gog and Magog, and also a prophecy about how in the last days, heaven will be rolled up like a scroll. Remember, the Bible was written centuries earlier, or in some cases, like the prophecies of Daniel, 1,200 years before Muhammad was even born, as Daniel was living during the time of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, documented in many historical and factual sources. The most disturbing thing about the text of the Quran that, in my opinion, points to a poor attempt to copy the Bible as sort of some kind of counterfeit text is the fact that the Quran is written in a very strange, concise sort of past tense. It tells the history of man in a very clipped, summarized manner, with verses like, Remember, Israelites, when we saved you from Pharaoh. Remember how I blessed you and set you apart from other people. Remember when we parted the Red Sea for you? Remember when we appointed 40 nights for Moses? Remember when we gave Moses the scripture? Remember when we gave you manna and quails to eat? That, to me, just sounds like filler to make the text sound authentic to those people who've never heard any other kind of religious text before. And perhaps maybe give it some kind of historical context or appearance of authenticity. The Quran tells those stories in a past tense, in quick overviews with only a sentence or two. And that's not how somebody talks or writes when they're recounting an event firsthand, or for the first time. That's the sort of thing you say to somebody at a cocktail party or a bonfire barbecue when you want to nudge them to tell an old tale that's been repeated several times over the years. For example, you're at a nighttime bonfire party in the woods, and you announce that you're going to go gather some firewood from the forest floor. And your friend pipes up and says, Hey mate, remember when you went camping and got lost a few summers ago? Remember when your sister had to call the authorities to send out a search party? Don't wander too far. Or something to that effect. The person that's saying remember when wasn't actually there and didn't witness the event and has no knowledge of all the details of what actually went down. But the story was repeated enough times that he brought it up in the right context with a basic understanding of what happened. You know what I'm saying. 
It doesn't sound authentic for a religious text to have so many verses that starts off with, remember when? It sounds like the words of somebody who's heard a story handed down dozens and dozens and maybe dozens of times, but who has no knowledge or understanding of the details because they weren't there firsthand. Remember, by this point, Christianity had been around for 600 years. Princeton University and worldhistory.org both have maps that show where Christianity was predominant in the year 600 AD, and it covers all of Southern and Western Europe, all of Turkey, Northern Africa, including the coastal areas of Egypt and Libya, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq, Iran, which was Persia back then, Armenia, and more. So, given that, I think it would have been easily plausible that Muhammad and or his associates or family or followers could have come across the missionaries or Christians who were trying to spread the gospel message and the story of Jesus with them. Not to mention the fact that the Hebrew or Jewish people had been telling the old prophecies and quoting scriptures from the ancient Torah scrolls across the region for millennia. Did you know that the Quran even makes reference to the Torah specifically? If you didn't know, again, the Torah refers to the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. When I read the Quran, it has a lot of the stories of the Bible, but is just written down in a strange abbreviated way. It tells of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Jacob and his sons, Zechariah and Elizabeth and their son John, who in the Bible was John the Baptist. There are even verses about Mary and Jesus. In the Quran, it says, again, using the weird remember when verbiage, remember when the angels proclaimed, O Mary, Allah gives you good news of a word from him. His name will be the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, honored in this world and in the hereafter, and he will be one of those nearest to Allah. Only from there, the text depicts Jesus as simply a prophet of the Jewish people who died, not who was the Messiah or the Son of God that was resurrected in three days after his death. But it only explains this piece in about three sentences, and then from there, the Quran goes on in more muddled, incohesive verses about how rebellious people who disbelieve and don't obey will be punished. Here is another bothersome and perplexing point to ponder. The Quran never once mentions Muhammad by name. It only mentions the title Muhammad four times. The word Muhammad means praiseworthy one. It would be like the entire Bible never mentioning Jesus' name ever, but instead only providing four references in the text pertaining to the Christ. Would that be an authoritative, historically accurate book that you could trust, depicting the story of a savior and a messiah if it didn't even mention him by name? Out of curiosity, I did a search within the original King James Version translation of the Bible, and the name Jesus appears 942 specific times. The name or term Christ appears 537 times. Yet, there are only four mentions of Muhammad in the Quran? That doesn't sound a little suspect now, does it? In fact, the Quran mentions Jesus by name several times, but not Muhammad. Weird, right? The Quran actually mentions Jesus 25 times. Moses is mentioned 136 times. Abraham, 69 times. Noah, 43 times. Lot, 27 times. Joseph, 27 times. You get the idea. So, Jesus is mentioned in the Quran 25 times, but Muhammad is only referenced four times? Yeah, that's a little odd. Have any of you ever read novels by the author Harry Turtledove? He's famous for writing fictional books about events in history, but with alternative historical endings. For example, the South wins the Civil War instead of the North, 
or the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor in World War II and end up occupying Hawaii. There's enough historical fact in the story to sound plausible and maybe even feel authoritative, but the plot diverges from what really happened into a new fictional account that feels unsettling and a little bit disconcerting to the reader. That's what the Quran feels like to me. Finally, Wikipedia also says that there are very strict rules regarding proper resuscitation of the Quran that determine in very precise detail how the text should be recited, how each individual syllable should be pronounced, and the requirement to pay attention to the places where there should be a pause and where the pronunciation should be long or short, or where letters should be sounded together and where they should be separated, etc., etc. In fact, the rules are so precise and so proper regarding the pronunciation of consonants and vowels of emphasis and melodic resuscitation that reciters of the Quran must follow a program of special training with a qualified teacher. Yet, Spend just five minutes scrolling through my Instagram reels and you'll see dozens and dozens of people of all ages, from old women with shaky voices and loose dentures, to young kids in Africa with thick accents, to teen boys and girls reading from their iPhones with music in the background, all reciting and reading scripture from the Bible, with words that are powerful and moving and overflowing with the power of the Holy Spirit in instruction and guidance and prayer for all who hear it. So I'm not a theologian or a Bible scholar. I've said that before. But if I were Satan and I wanted to lure masses upon masses of people away from Christ and from believing the Bible is the authoritative written word of God, what better plan than to come up with an alternative false religion? Is it a coincidence that this opposing false religion that's in direct opposition to Christianity began in the very same region and, in fact, demanded that a mosque be built on the mount in Jerusalem where the temple of the Jews once stood? The mosque remains there to this day, in what is by far the most contested, fought over place in the entire world. And we Christians accept that easily enough. To each their own, we say, respect other religions, right? There are a lot of people who are thinking there can be many paths to God, or that Christians are only tasked to save the atheists, you know, to preach the gospel to the lost or the addicted or the agnostic, the searching, the grieving, but leave the Muslims alone because we have to respect their religion. However, it states in Matthew 28, 18, and 19, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. My Christian brothers and sisters, believers of the Muslim faith are just as deceived and under attack as you or I were in the depth of our gambling addiction. And that should wreck our souls and endear us to them. There is only one true path to God. The Bible and the Quran cannot both be true. Why? Because they are in direct conflict and opposition with each other. They teach very different things, yet both with the promise that they are the truth. In the Bible, one of the most well-known verses is John 14, 6, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's pretty clear. No one comes to the Father God in heaven except through Christ. And John 3.16 tells us that Jesus Christ is the one and only true Son of God sent to this earth to die once for all of our sins and then was resurrected by the Father to take the seat at the right hand of God on the throne and for those who believe in him will have eternal life with him. 
It is by faith that we have been saved and cleansed from our sins, guaranteeing our inheritance of eternal life. The Quran says there is no God but Allah, and that Christ was never resurrected, but simply a good and knowledgeable prophet, and that it is by good works and good deeds that you get eternal life. The message of the Islamic religion was given and written down 600 years after the death of Christ. So they cannot both be true. One of them is false. And so I have two questions to close this out. How do you know for sure, 100% without a doubt, that you have eternity in heaven with Christ as a Christian believer? Answer, if you have faith and follow him, anyone can do it. Anyone can pray anywhere. Anyone can read the Bible, even out loud. You can read it with an accent. You can read it with various translations. You can study it anywhere, anytime, without special training or certification. Why? Because it is the living, breathing Word of God that is alive and powerful and able to change the lives of people, families, even nations. And if you believe His Word, and if you believe that Christ is the Savior who died for our sins and rose again, then you are saved and you will get your reward and inheritance. You can count on that. God promised it. That's the scorecard. Even a child can understand that. Second question, how do you know for sure, 100% without a doubt, that you will have eternity in heaven as a Muslim? In all of my reading, researching, learning, and listening, I was never able to figure that out. There are dozens and dozens of articles, teachings, videos, books, blogs, all saying some form of, well, it's a combination of good works and asking for forgiveness of sins. But not one single person knows the absolute truth of what that combination is. How many good works do you need to do? Does giving your chair to somebody count as a good work? Does it count as much as letting somebody have your parking spot? How many times do you have to ask for forgiveness? Do you just ask once and it covers everything? Or do you have to ask several times a day? Or do you have to ask every time you do something wrong? What is the scorecard? The precise assurance that you know you'll spend eternity in paradise as a Muslim is obscure. The bottom line is, not one single person can answer that question. In the end, they all just say that Allah will judge each individual accordingly, based on how they lived righteously. Like most other religions, whether Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism, etc., Islam requires humans to climb the ladder and rise up in their status toward God, to strive higher, to perform outward acts of righteous, godly living in order to rise up the ranks of achievement with the hope that if they do enough, if they lived cleanly enough, or asked for forgiveness enough, or prayed enough, they will find out upon their death that they've transformed themselves into the required holiness in order to receive eternity in paradise. Yet Christianity is the only one religion where God came down to us here, down here in our lowly place in order to perform the transformation in our hearts and spirits so that we may live out all of our days knowing with assured confidence and trusted promise that our inheritance is already sealed, signed, and waiting for us. God tells us he writes our names in the book of life that gives us entry into heaven, and every single believer knows that our name is in there. There's no guesswork. You don't have to hope that you did enough. Our faith cleanses us right here and now, so we don't have to wait and wonder, not knowing if we did enough or whether we made it or not. God sent Jesus to save sinners, not the righteous. 
For no one can be righteous. What human hasn't lied? What human hasn't stolen something? Hasn't cheated in some way? We can't save ourselves through works or good deeds or prayers. Works and good deeds and prayers are the result of our salvation in Christ, not the cause of it. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 says, For it is by grace that you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Just this morning, my husband sent me an Instagram reel, which I'll link in the show notes of this episode. It shows an ISIS leader who heard the voice of Jesus speaking to him. In the video, he was clearly shaken and in awe and tells how Jesus told him that he forgives him now, that he didn't have to wait and find out if he was forgiven or not. That's exactly what I'm trying to explain. It's so moving to watch. Now, this is not me saying that all Muslims are terrorists or associated with ISIS. What I am saying is that he was a perfect example of someone who knew nothing of Jesus, and yet was so loved by him anyway. Like me when I was young, that man in the video had no knowledge of the one true God. So, if there are many, many people who don't know, it is our great honor and responsibility to share the joy of the good news of Christ with them. Isn't that our great commission, our whole purpose in life? I want others who were lost like I was to be found like I was. The Lord's amazing grace can do that. Let us share that gift of salvation to those who so desperately need it. Do you know who was the very first person to enter paradise with Jesus? It was a thief who was nailed on the cross next to him. Jesus had one thief on each side of him hanging on their own cross. One of them said mockingly, hurling insults, Aren't you the Messiah? So save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him, saying, Don't you fear God, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we're just getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, Truly, I tell you, Today you will be with me in paradise. Luke 23, 39-43 That thief was never baptized, never went to church, never formally prayed, never read a single verse of scripture, and lived the life of a sinner, a criminal. Yet because he saw Christ for who he really was and what he really did for us, that faith was poured out onto that man in his last moments of life cleansing him from all wrongdoing so that he may be worthy to spend eternity with God in paradise. Jesus said in John 4.14, Whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Back to my listener who is asking, I presume, because he's genuinely interested or perhaps searching like I was all those years ago. There is something Christian teachers often use with people who are asking, seeking, or wanting to know more about the one true God, or if there's a God at all or if he's real. It's a three-week challenge. Find a Bible or download a Bible app or go to the website BibleGateway.com. I'll put a link in the description show notes of this episode. But it's easy to find a Bible online. So go to the book of John. There are 21 chapters within the book of John. John was a disciple of Jesus who walked and talked and learned from Jesus in person, and he was known as the disciple that Jesus loved. Read one chapter of John every day for three weeks. If you're really serious and really want to know, 
Read it once in the morning and again at night before you go to bed. The chapters are short. They take less than 10 minutes to read. Read one every day for 21 days. And as you read, pray and ask God to show you. For Christ said, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives, and the one who seeks, finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Matthew 7, verses 7 and 8. You, my dear friends, will be amazed at what you discover. And when you do, please write me. I want to hear about it. I will be praying for you. And if you are in a place or a situation where you do not have access to a Bible or can't download or search the Bible, you can still pray. I promise the Lord will hear you and he will answer you. He will provide you the way, the truth, and the life. And if anyone else needs prayer for spiritual or physical or mental healing, email me please, maria at thefeelingbetter.com. God bless you all and keep you safe. I will see you again next Sunday. Thanks for listening. Like